Okay, let's get started. Hi everyone, welcome to the Space Science webinar series uh, uh, hosted by the Center for Space Science at NYU Abu Dhabi in collaboration with the UAE Space Agency. And today we have a special seminar. Uh, we had our speaker, he had to cancel it last moment. And so all our undergraduate students stepped up to the occasion and they are presenting on the theme of uh, human exploration of Mars. Uh, so these are students from all over the world, uh, uh, from California, uh, in the Western side, in the Eastern sides, all the way from New Zealand. And they will, they have been working with me for the past two months. And so they will be presenting uh, their results. Uh, so let's get started. So first of all, uh, let's get started with uh, Ishani, who is uh, in uh, Dubai. Ishani, can you? You can share your screen, right? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, can you see my screen? Yeah. Yep. Okay, sure. Let's go. So, um, in the past few weeks, as we all know, there have been multiple missions to Mars. UA's NASA, UA's uh, Mars mission, uh, NASA's Mars mission, and China's Mars mission. And um, there's always been a lot of interest in studying Mars, given how it's the planet most similar to our Earth in the solar system. And as such, makes for a good starting point to probe the million dollar question, does life exist beyond Earth? Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, my name is Ishani Mate, and today I'll be giving a presentation on research we've done this summer titled um, Analysis of Radiation Exposure in Astronauts in Long-Term Space Missions. Um, led by Dr. Dimitar Atri, um, our group uh, has 15 students, and we've been given different areas to maximize efficiency. My part in this project was being a member of the ionizing radiation team, and as such, the focus of my part will be on simulation of radiation, analysis of its results, and their significance. So why exactly have there been so many missions to Mars? Um, well, these missions hope to give us an even better understanding of the red planet, and eventually we hope to send astronauts to Mars. But doing so will require us to have a proper understanding of the environment they'll be dealing with, not just on the planet, but during transit as well. And one aspect of the environment is the radiation exposure they will be subjected to, and um, that's why we're doing this project. The project is titled Radiation and its Effects on Astronauts Held in Long-Term Space Mission. The sub-teams within the project were ionizing radiation, ionizing radiation and astronaut health, and radiation mitigation techniques. Our project aims to estimate the effect of long-term radiation exposure on astronauts with focus on the lower orbit, transit to Mars, and exposure on the Martian surface. Um, to understand this project, though, first we must understand the type of radiation we'll be focus on, focusing on, and that will be done by Aza. Um, thank you, Shani, and hi, everyone. So I'll move into talking about the different types of radiation. Um, radiation can be either ionizing, which is high energy, or non-ionizing, which is low energy. And an example of non-ionizing is the UV radiation that we're exposed to uh, from the sun. But since we're talking about deep space missions, our concern would be the ionizing radiation, which can be in the form of galactic cosmic rays uh, coming from deep space, uh, or trapped particles uh, in the Earth magnetic field, also known as the Van Allen radiation belts, and also solar particles caused by uh, the sudden bursts from the sun. Next slide. So in order to assess the impact of a long duration mission to Mars, we compiled the data available from uh, several missions, including Apollo, Curiosity, and the International Space Station. So if we look at the Apollo mission, which is the furthest point traveled by humans beyond low Earth orbit, the average radiation dose uh, varied with the time duration. Although the dosage is small and had no harmful impact on the astronaut health, there was some biological observations reported. 
And from the Curiosity mission, we have the GCR measured during the first 300 souls. And as you can see, the radiation varied between 180 to 225 uh, micrograde per day. So based on the finding, uh, for one trip, it would be an estimate of uh, one sievert. But again, this will vary depending on the solar activity, shielding thickness, and other cosmic radiation activity. Next slide. Okay, so to estimate the ionizing dose, we use SPENVIS to model the space radiation environment. And we looked at three different target materials, tissue, bone, and water. The model determined the absorbed dose as a function of depth in aluminum shielding material. And it can be seen from the figures that the absorbed dose by the target material decreases as we increase uh, the shielding thickness. So more uh, of the simulation and the analysis will be covered in the next slides uh, with Ishani and Shriram. Hey everyone, I'm Sriram and thank you Ishani and Azza. So as Azza has already shown you, Hello? Yeah, go ahead, Sweden. Oh, yeah, sorry. So there are multiple parts to our project right now. So first of all, as Aza has already mentioned, we do have data from multiple missions on the solar proton data. So we do know how much radiation is actually present on transit to Mars, on the Mars surface, and at low Earth orbit. So but then how do we make calculations and how do you, how do you make studies on it? It's not possible to take astronauts and keep them in the target location. So that's why we computationally predict how much radiation is going to be deposited in the astronauts and what their effects might be. Next slide, please. So we use a toolkit called Gion4. And Gion4 is a toolkit that we use to uh, model the interactions between matter and particles. And Gion4 has an inbuilt module called the human phantom module. So it, it has a collection of all materials like the tissue, bones, and uh, the muscles of the human body and they make it together and bring it together and to make a human body. And now that happens since you already have the data of the radiation in the particular places. We simulate, we simulate it using inbuilt uh, particle sources in Gion4. Next slide, please. And as you can see here, so the main target of this study in this uh, uh, particular simulation has been to uh, find the radiation deposition by uh, solar proton. And as you, are, as you all are aware, the solar, uh, there are multiple solar events happening all throughout uh, at every single time. And since you already have the data and getting the, the energy uh, deposited in the astronaut by each uh, proton itself, we can then make predictions as to uh, how much radiation will actually be deposited for each uh, solar event. Next slide, please. And once we get the results from Gion4, we use a software called Root. And a, a sample output is shown on the screen here where you have IDs there. So these IDs are, are the uh, organ IDs in Gion4 human phantom module. Each organ ID corresponds to one particular outcome. And you can also see that you can see the uh, amount of energy deposited. So uh, Ishani will be explaining a little bit more about how we did the analysis using Root and Python. Thank you, Shira. Um, so for so when uh, Sriram uh, simulated the data, what we got were root files, and you can't use you know they're not like zip files or anything. You need to use a very specific software to analyze them. So what we used was a software called a uh, root developed by CERN. Uh, it enables statistically sound scientific analysis and visualization of large amounts of data, which was convenient for this project because we were doing hundreds of thousands of runs and root files encompassed a lot of data very easily. Um, we wrote a macro in C++ so we could analyze root files and find the energy deposition on each organ ID. But since the total energy deposition was accumulation of hundreds of thousands of runs, to get the average, we divided the number of runs, we divided the energy for, uh, the sum of energy for each organ by the number of runs for that file. So um, if there was a file with, say, energy of 100 MeV having 250K runs, the macro would find total energy deposition for whatever organ ID required. And then that value would be divided by the number of runs of that particular file. So in this case, they would have divided it by 250K, like 250,000. So uh, once we did that, the, we understood that this project is the theoretical counterpart of the actual mission to Mars. And as with every other scientific project, there are bound to be some discrepancies between the practical and the theoretical. 
um, the data we obtained by the simulation was plotted using a Python program. This was done for each organ ID with the energy deposition on the y-axis and energy on the x-axis. In a lot of cases, we utilized um, logarithmic binning, which basically means instead of doing it for energies of 10 MeV, 20 MeV, 30 MeV, we simulated energies with 10 raised to 1, 10 raised to 2, et cetera, et cetera. So we still get to 100,000 MeV, which was the highest we did, but only with way fewer stuffs. Um, the main outcomes of this project were to understand the radiation doses absorbed by different organs. Once we calculated the radiation dose deposited on the entire solar spiral spectrum. And then pinpoint the mitigation techniques that would be the most effective according to data that we obtained. Only after going through biological literature will we be able to predict the potential side effects of being exposed to radiation. Um, our project only simulated uh, protons, obviously, but there are other neat sources of radiation in outer space and understanding their impact is just as crucial. The results obtained during the course of this project are by the simulation of radiation on the male human phantom model, MIRD, only. And as such, we did not get data on organs that are specific or exclusive to the female anatomy. Um, there are other models such as ICRP and VCH, and it would be advantages for us to understand radiation analysis using these models as well. So I think even though our journey is, you know, it's, it's a long way off, I think we can still, you know, keep participating in studies like these so we can understand more about the red planet and boldly go no one's gone before. All right. Thank you, Shani, Sira, Naza. That was great. So now that we can model how much radiation dose is deposited in each organ, now we need to compare that with real data, with radiation therapy data and figure out what kind of biological effects uh, would be faced by astronauts. And to do that, we have Caitlin. Can you share your screen, Caitlin? Can you see that? Yep. Cool. Hi everyone, I'm Caitlin MacArthur. I'm from New Zealand um, and I'm a biomedical science student. So I'm gonna be talking about the impact of ionizing radiation on human body systems. Um, and just for reference, the amount of radiation that we're typically talking about when looking at traveling to Mars or on the surface of Mars is around one to two sievits. Um, and that is usually protons or like HZD particles making up that radiation. Okay, so the first, this is um, looking at kind of a systemic effect of radiation on the body, and this is acute radiation syndrome. And in medicine, acute refers to an illness that is very severe for a short amount of time. So this affects the body. There's three main syndromes, and the first is the hematopoietic syndrome, um, which is of the largest concern for astronauts due to the space flight radiation doses that we'd expect to see. And so this is, this um, hematopoietic syndrome affects the formation of blood cells. So red and white blood cells, which has consequences such as anemia and also impairs the immune system and the ability of the body to fight off an infection. Um, then we have the gastrointestinal syndrome, which due to the radiation dose that this typically occurs at, it's um, less of a concern for astronauts. But if there was some sort of, you know, historical disaster like Chernobyl or something, this would be a lot more relevant. And then the last one, which is at the highest radiation dose, is the neurovascular syndrome, which affects the, the um, nervous system and the blood vessels. Okay, so this is about the nervous system. And this graphic here is showing the radiotherapy treatment of a brain tumor. It's affecting the middle of the brain stem here. Um, and you can see that the red color coding represents an area which is re um, receiving more radiation. And then as you get out towards the blue, that's getting less radiation. So what this is showing is the actual mass of the cancer versus the amount of tissue that is getting hit by radiation. And when you have healthy tissue getting hit by radiation, it can cause all sorts of effects, such as fatigue, cognitive dysfunction, mood changes, hair loss, and skin erythema. Erythe erythe fatigue is the biggest concern for astronauts. 
um, because astronauts obviously need to be really alert when they're partaking in space travel. Um, and one characteristic of fatigue that's induced by irradiation is that it doesn't come right from resting or sleeping more, but there are certain medications that can help. Um, and then the skin erythema um, can have, it's like basically just burning of the skin from the radiation effects. Um, so it just creates, it's like a sunburn, but a lot more intense. And so a lot of the knowledge that we have of how radiation affects the body does come from radiotherapy as a cancer treatment. Okay, so the next system that I looked at was um, the skeletal system looking at bones. So this is a microscope slide showing two um, cells that function in maintaining bones. So these osteoblasts, these lighter blue cells that you can see here, they function in synthesizing bone and then these darker purple cells are the grave bone. And there was an experiment done that looked at how these cells respond to different um, radiation doses, looking at zero to eight grays, which is like space flight relevant. Um, and they found that osteoblasts um, decrease in number following radiation exposure and osteoclasts actually increase initially. So you've got this decrease in cells that build bone and an increase in cells that destroy bone. So that just contributes to overall bone loss. Um, and studies have shown that bone loss following spaceflight can persist from anywhere from nine weeks to four months, depending on the dosage of radiation that was experienced by the astronauts. So that has big implications, especially in, um, in combination with the microgravity that is experienced during space travel. Okay, so then we have the immune system. And this is another microscope slide showing different cells of the immune system. So uh, there are two um, different arms of the immune system. There's the innate immune system, which includes these leukocyte cells, so eosinophils, neutrophils, and basophils. And this is the, like, the body's first line of defense against an infection, so it just kills off any bacteria. But this innate immune system isn't always sufficient, and sometimes you need what is the adaptive immune system. And the adaptive immune system is responsible for remembering an infection. So if you've had chicken pox or measles, you don't typically get sick again because your adaptive immune system remembers how to fight it off. And your adaptive immune system is made up of these lymphocytes, which are the cells here with the really big purple nuclei that you can see. Um, and both of these groups of cells have been shown to um, decrease in population size following ra radiation from this range of 0.5 to 3 grays, which again is space flight relevant. And so this is a concern for astronauts because with an impaired immune system, the ability to fight off an infection is a lot weaker. Um, and this, this dose dependent decline can persist when the astronaut returns to Earth. So it's that makes them a lot more vulnerable coming back to Earth in terms of getting sick. Cardiovascular is a big concern with radiation and it's seen a lot in um, radiotherapy patients as well. But here we've got some notable historical radiation disasters. The Chernobyl disaster they've studied and seen that at just 0.15 grays, the risk of radiation-induced cardiovascular disease can increase. So that's a really small amount of radiation exposure and is definitely relevant to spaceflight. Then secondly, we've got the atomic bombings in Japan, which showed that um, survivors to very common late effects that are seen in survivors are hypertension and ischemic heart disease. So those are both um, big warning factors of cardiovascular disease. And then lastly, there have been studies of the Apollo astronauts that have shown them to have considerably higher risks of developing cardiovascular disease compared to astronauts that remain in the low Earth orbit, such as in the International Space Station. And um, a lot of that is to do with that greater radiation exposure that you get when you leave the geomagnetic field of Earth and you are just out in the open and vulnerable to whatever is thrown at you. Okay, so cancer is a big concern and NASA have set a limit of how greater risk an astronaut can have in 
following their radiation exposure to develop cancer as a result. And that, risk, that limit is 3%. And studies have shown that male astronauts will exceed this within 24 months of just being in low Earth orbit, and female astronauts will exceed it in 18 months. Um, and this is because females have a lot, of more, a lot more cancers that are female specific, such as breast cancer and ovarian cancer. So in a trip to Mars, which would take longer and have higher radiation dose, this would definitely be exceeded in that mission. So there's a lot of medical technology that needs to be developed before this can be safe. Martian soil is a very interesting um, risk factor for astronauts because it interacts with UV radiation to generate dangerous compounds. Because um, Martian soil is rich in perchlorate, which when it interacts with UV radiation can generate more dangerous compounds like hypochlorite, and these are dangerous for the lungs. And also because Martian soil is really fine, it can cause a lot of scar tissue in the lungs if it gets breathed in. So, and they, they've shown this in animal studies, like with mice. So looking at how this soil affects the lungs, and it's a big concern for the pulmonary health of astronauts who may visit Mars in the future. Um, and so I had the help of Maria, who was from Colombia, working on this research, but she has, um, for medical reasons, can't be here. Um, but she was looking at the GI tract specifically and the, the sensitivity of different components of the GI tract to radiation. So you'll see that a lot of these doses here are quite a lot bigger than what we would expect to see in spaceflight travel. Um, but one specific aspect of her research was that colorectal cancer is a really big concern for astronauts just because of that 3% radiation limit and how quickly that can be exceeded when traveling in interplanetary space. Um, and then she looked at the GI microbiome. And the microbiome is basically all of your gut bacteria that are there to take up space and nutrients so that dangerous bacteria can't get in. Um, and this GI microbiome was has been seen to be disrupted and imbalanced in astronauts following exposure to radiation. So this, again, opens them up vulnerable to infection. Um, and so all of these different ways that the body is impacted by radiation exposure just shows how much research needs to be done in terms of medical mitigation strategies to protect future astronauts. Thank you for listening to my presentation. All right, thanks a lot, Caitlin, it was great. Yeah, so now we understand uh, how human body responds to this radiation dose between one and two sieverts. And now let us uh, learn more about the biological impact and how to mitigate the impact of this uh, radiation by making some dietary changes. And to do that, we have Roberto Parisi. Roberto, can you share your screen? Yes, can you see it? Yep. Okay. So, hello everybody. My name is Roberto and today I'm going to talk about what are the effects of ionizing radiation, not on the macroscopic scale, but inside the cell. What happens inside the cell when there are ionizing radiation around us and especially astronauts during the space missions. Um, the aim of our project was, uh, do you see here a um, bl black uh, thing? Because yeah, yeah, I am, yeah. yeah, okay, I'm going to, can you see now without the... We see your slide. Okay. Um, the aim of the, our project was understanding what, are the, what were the effects of ionizing radiation on space missions. And as you can see from this graph that has been taken from this article, there are many sources of ionizing radiation in uh, our uh, system, um, in the solar system, like for example, the Van Allen belt, it is also dangerous for space technology, sun radiation, but cosmic rays that are rich in um, gamma rays that are very dangerous for our health. And for this reason, we understood that ionizing radiation were one of the biggest limitations that we have today in order to succeed with future human missions. And for this is we investigate more what happens when the human body interacts with this kind of radiation doses. Um, I uh, focus on what happens inside the cell and one of the most important things that I understood was the presence of these reactive oxygen species that are just compounds, chemical compounds that um, have in, inside of them oxygen and that have unpaired electrons in the other shell that may interact with 
particular elements in our cells, like for example, lipids, um, proteins, or uh, nucleic acids. But as you can see, uh, reactive oxygen species are not always uh, dangerous for our cell because they are also an indicator of the presence of oxygen inside our cell. Um, as you can see, they are um, involved in particular processes, like for example, the cellular growth, um, when, uh, for example, the activity of mitochondria uh, increase, it means that uh, cells are going to proliferate more, and so on. You can see that they are um, involved in many uh, cellular pathways. But when this production is dysregulated, we can have lots of problems when it comes to the ostrom cell. Uh, for example, a lot of inflammation, but also cardiovascular diseases. One of the most important uh, demonstration that we have in uh, human pathology is surely uh, the hypercholesterolemia that is um, caused by genetic diseases linked to the uh, receptor for the apolipoprotein B100 that leads to the accumulation of uh, lipids in our uh, blood system that tend to be oxidized and then macrophages uh, eat them, uh, creating the foam cells. And then we have the creation of clots that may cause infection. So as you can see, if we have the dysregulation of reactive oxygen species, we can have lots of different pathologies in the human body. Mm. At the same time, um, I investigated what happens to the DNA while we have uh, the exposure to ionizing radiation. Um, from this image, you can see that ionizing radiation comes from the outside of the cell it starts uh, causing damages to the membrane because we have the peroxidation of lipids. And this um, sole event can lead to the um, onset of apoptosis or mostly, uh, at times, uh, necrosis. Um, the ionizing radiation has an indirect but also direct um, impact on DNA. The indirect uh, pathway uh, involves uh, the reactive oxygen species because ionizing radiation interact with the different compounds that have oxygen inside the cell, creating these uh, particular reactive species. But they also can disrupt uh, directly the DNA interacting with this backbone of the filament. And so we have the disruption of interactions between a phosphate group and the sugar that is deoxyribose. And in this way, we can have some events like, for example, when it comes to the filaments, we can have breaks. When it comes to interaction with bases, we have usually mutations that are also linked to the onset um, of cancer, for example, the single nuclear polymorphism and something like that. As you can see here, we have then a protein modification linked to the modification of information coding in our DNA. And one of the worst aspects is surely genomic instability that preludes to the onset of cancer. So there is a strictly um, um, correlation between ionizing radiation exposure and the onset of cancer. First of all, we decided to investigate what are the main uh, reactive oxygen species sources inside the cell. And we define these three uh, fundamental elements, the water that uh, makes up to the 70% of the intracellular um, environment, the molecular oxygen, that is used for the cell in order to make the cellular respiration, but also mitochondria. Mitochondria own a particular um, series of enzymes called um, ETC, that means electronic transfer chain, that complete the process of, the process of cellular respiration. And uh, between the enzymes involved, we can find, for example, the ubiquinone that also exists in particular um, uh, forms, like, for example, a semiquinone that is a particularly unsta unstable form that has an impaired electron in the other shell. So it is something that we usually find in the uh, homeostatic condition in the cell. But as you can see here, the most important element is surely water because we said that it makes up to the 70% of the cell inside. And when um, the water is exposed to ionizing radiation, there is a phenomenon called the radiolysis that uh, is uh, bound to create a lot of different species. And some of these species may interact directly with the DNA, with the uh, bases. For example, the guanine may be converted in oxoguanin, that is a modified base pair that then is uh, repaired by our cellular systems. And um, some of them, like for example, the superoxidanium, may interact with the um, oxid, uh, the nitrate oxid, oxid, leading to the creation of uh, peroxide nitrites that then can interact with the lipid of the membrane and so-called other damages. 
Um, there, uh, we have analyzed the role of these fundamental uh, elements that we usually find in our system. Uh, it's the glutathion. Glutathion is a free peptide that has in the center this uh, particular protein, uh, I mean, sorry, an amino acid that is called the cysteine. And cysteine um, can um, create these uh, disulfide bonds that um, in this process may lead to the transformation of peroxide, the hydrogen peroxide in just um, water. So the glutathione is involved in these processes that can convert reactive oxygen species in something that is not wrong or dangerous for the cell. And um, for this reason, uh, since there are also evidence in literature that, for example, glutathione may have a protective role on neurons after exposure to ionizing radiation, we would suggest that osteoids may follow a particular dietary um, um, process. Um, first of all, they should be really active, and it's something that is already done because osteoids usually have a very strong training because space, uh, before space missions, but also they should implement a lot of uh, vegetables and fruits in their diets in order to have a boosting glutathione and so protect their cells from the onset of this uh, ROS production. Then uh, we um, also explore the other uh, um, aspects, for example, why not um, increasing the number of vitamins that are absorbed by astronauts. As you can see from this image, there are two fundamental vitamins that are vitamin C and vitamin E, and they both collaborate in order to convert reactive oxygen species in uh, carboxylic acids or alcoholic groups that are something that is usually uh, dismantled by our liver thanks to the mechasomal system. And so this way we can convert um, dangerous elements in something that our liver and our body can process. Um, and also probiotics, because how we, as we have uh, understood before uh, from Caitlin's presentation, when we have exposure to ionizing radi radiation, there is always a dysbiosis of the gastrointestinal tract and this reason um, implementing probiotics can protect the bacteria that live inside us. Um, then um, we are moving towards the understanding of the molecular basis of this interaction between ionizing radiation and DNA. And for this reason, um, I chose this graph that resumes everything that we uh, have discussed this, the, during the summer. Uh, for example, we have the NHIJ and the HR that are the main important uh, mechanism of repairing. And these are activated after that the ionizing radiation causes or basis modifications, that is something that is linked to mutagenesis, or DNA breaks that was the something that we were talking before. And as you can see from these two images, this is a single strand break, and this is a double strand break. This is the most cytotoxic event that can happen inside a cell. For this reason, when uh, these uh, events happen, we have this um, mechanism of repairing, but it's not, uh, it doesn't have a high fidelity. And for this reason, uh, usually we have the onset of cancer or for example, of aging and it's something that also has to be taken into account when we consider the effects of the telomeric elongation due to the presence in the other space. Um, the next step that we are moving towards uh, with our project is, is for DNA simulation. Here we have the description of the number of the double strand breaks with a particular uh, simulation that considers a 40 nanometer side tube that has inside the uh, DNA fragments shot randomly. And we are moving towards the, uh, the analysis of a whole uh, cell nucleus in order to understand if there is a statistically different number of double uh, strand breaks uh, when we compare this information to the data coming from people who live in Earth. And uh, the next step is also understanding if the number of double strand breaks may be correlated with uh, the uh, increasing of cancer risk. That is something that has already been investigated in, um, in uh, literature, but we want to understand on a uh, numerical point of view what happens inside a cell, especially the DNA damage that we can uh, analyze. So for this reason, this is just a conclusive take home message uh, from the presentation. We have understood that ionizing radiation is something really dangerous. And also it is one of the biggest limitations that we have for nostril health. But 
today we have lots of ways in order to mitigate these processes. Uh, for example, we can start from something really simple, so modifying the diets of astronauts, to um, something more sophisticated and linked to engineering, like, for example, the development of new uh, shielding strategies. So thanks for your attention. Yeah, thank you, Roberto. Uh, this, uh, so now, as he said, uh, we have shielding strategies in terms of diet. And now let us move on to engineering now. And uh, Shireen Mathur will talk about different engineering approaches to mitigate the impacts of this radiation. Is it visible? Yep. Hello, everyone. So this is Shireen Mathur. I'm from Amity University, Mumbai, and I'm currently in final year aerospace engineering. So I'll be representing my team, radiation mitigation team. My fellow teammates are Tammy Vidzins and Julia Vasani, and our mentor is Dr. Dumitra Arti. So as both Eldrin rightly said, Mars is there waiting to be reached. So, our project is main focus is on radiation protection strategies for crewed mission on Mars, since Mars is a hot topic, or rather I would say a cold topic. So, like we had divided that task, I am focusing on passive shielding, Tammy's work is on active shielding, and Julia is doing on Martian habitats. Our main motivation is because radiation is a huge problem for astronauts, especially in long-term space missions, and you know, when they are outside Earth's protection, they really don't have anything to protect them from the harmful radiation. And there are different kinds of radiation. There are solar particles, then there are background, background cosmic radiations, and there are many other different kinds of radiations as well. So basically, we are trying to, pro uh, way, trying to find ways to protect astronauts from this radiation. Getting to Mars is a very risky thing, and our main goal is to make a stable and safe life on Mars. Talking about passive shielding, it includes use of a sufficient amount of material which absorbs energy from cosmic radiation. The main materials that we can use are polyethylene, graphite, aluminum, copper, and water. There are certain comparison criteria to compare these materials to find out which is the most effective material. And that is number of electrons per unit mass, mean excitation energy, tight binding conditions, as well as shielding effectiveness. And while comparing all the materials using these criteria, we found out that hydrogen is the most effective material. Now, since polyethylene has two atoms of hydrogen in per molecule, we can say that polyethylene is the most convenient material. Also, it reduces the dose by 21 to 31 percent, depending on the depth of the target. Currently, polyethylene is being used in the sleeping quarters as well as the galleries of International Space Station. Shifting off to active shielding. Active shielding is like a mobile magnetosphere. Currently, in ISS, uh, we are using a supermagnet, namely AMS-02. This magnet is not used to uh, protect for, from radiation, but it, currently it is being used to detect the different kind of radiation that ISS encounters. One of the variation developed by the AMS collaboration team is double helix. The, this uh, super magnet can reduce the radiation by 40 to 60 percent, making Mars missions as safe as ISS for the astronauts. This is the design of the double helix super magnet. So as you can see, it has 12 magnetic coils. It has to be two meter in diameter and it has to be 18 meter long. Shifting off to Martian habitats. So like we know, Mars has a very thin atmosphere and it, it doesn't have a magnetic field like Earth. So transporting uh, construction materials from Earth would be a very costly thing for us. So the best favorite solution would be to use in situ resources. Now we have surface regolith, which is specially rich in water, which can create excellent protection against cosmic radiations. We can have two possibilities of habitat on Mars. One is habitat on surface and one is below surface. Talking about habitat on Mars, water rich regolith mixture can be used and it, can, it, is, it will provide the best protection against radiation. It decreases is the, the, the but problem with technical problem with this is that it also, it can also cause uh, secondary radiations. So to counter that we can add polymer binds to it, to this mixture, and it will be the best solution to it. Now there can be some psychological problems on this habitat because we humans are uh, habitual of having windows in our houses. Now since Mars has radiation, we, we do a very thin atmosphere, so it won't be possible to have windows in our habitat while on the surface. The other type of habitat can be under surface. 
So in the northern region, northern regions of Mars, we have found out caves and lava tubes, which have twenty meter thick roofs. So you know we can have actually below the surface also the astronauts can be really really safe from the environment. But the same technical and psychological problems are same here. Humans are not habitual of living under the surface. Of course, they would feel really uh, scared if they are under the surface, like twenty, uh, twenty to thirty meters, or maybe dozens of layers of uh, layers of meters of uh, rock surface above their heads. So it would be necessary to make them convenient under in on such habitats. This can be the images, the ideas of above surface and under surface. So as you can see. This is the above surface habitat taken from on a paper in 2015, and this can be the idea of under surface habitat. So our outcome of this project says that there are many risks for Mars missions, and radiation is just one one of them. So this study would be a good step forward. There can be a never single solution. In future, we can try a different combinations of these techniques. and we can apply those techniques to all uh, different space missions it can be moon missions or it can be interplanetary missions or maybe farther away in solar system like that now technical technology is taking birth every single day so let's hope we have better techniques in future and we can have a better missions thank you all right thanks a lot shree yeah so as shree said there are different types of techniques that can be implemented to mitigate the impacts of this radiation and the next step in our research is to put these astronauts inside these shields and figure out how much uh, reduction in radiation those actually uh, is achieved using our numerical models uh now after this uh, we have a very interesting topic Paulina and Julia are going to talk about sustainability in context of Mars exploration. All right, can you see my screen? Yes. Yep. Okay. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Okay, whenever you're ready, Julia. So, We often hear about how being sustainable on Earth is important, but we have hardly ever heard about how being sustainable in space is as important and necessary. We are Julia Bastani and Polina Umanski with our mentor Dr. Dimitra Atri, and today we're going to discuss sustainable exploration. Next slide. I'm sure you've all realized that setting foot on Mars is the goal of our generation, and not only more and more countries are aiming to it. Let me just mention some of the most recent missions, like Hope, Perseverance, and Tianwen One. But the space sector is in continuous growth, and more and more companies and institutions are aiming to reaching beyond the atmosphere. Next. Since we're anticipating crewed missions to Mars, and in light of all of the environmental problems that humans have caused on Earth, we wanted to look into protecting Mars and other bodies for the sake of future exploration. So we came up with a few research questions that we wanted to look into. The first is what protects planetary bodies, and to what extent? What does it mean to be sustainable on other planets? So what kinds of technologies would we be using? And how can space exploration help sustainability on Earth? So to answer the first question, we looked into current planetary protection policy. So it sort of began in 1958, what when what is known as today, the um, International Science Council founded the Committee on Space Research, or COSPER, with the goal of having a group that can provide guidelines to those researching space. Then in 1967, the United Nations created the Outer Space Treaty. With the goal of promoting peace in space, and this is the only international and legally binding agreement that has any mention of planetary protection policy. But its Article Nine, which is the part that talks about planetary protection, is pretty vague since the treaty was focused on peace and not necessarily on planetary protection. And all it really says is that when we go to other bodies, we want to explore them and avoid their harmful contamination. So in 1967, Cosper read this Outer Space Treaty and decided that it wanted to create policy recommendations so that nations could follow this Outer Space Treaty. However, it interpreted the harmful contamination bit 
as just biological contamination. So COSPER's policies have just focused on biological contamination. So things like keeping spacecraft clean. So the shortcomings of current policies are that they are life biased, meaning that they just focus on biological contamination. And this is problematic because we need more legal guidance on how to act on other planets. There are just some questions that regard planetary protection that we just don't have answers to. Like, can we leave trash on Mars or can we mine Olympus Mons? We just don't know, even though those questions arguably fall under planetary protection. So then we decided to look into sustainability as a part of planetary protection, since a lot of recent literature began to reflect the need for sustainability. And so we decided to come up with all the reasons we could for why planetary protection should be expanded into sustainability. So how sustainability could help solve the problems that I previously mentioned. And the first is that sustainability would help, would be protecting astrobiology and other fields. So biological life can be affected by non-biological factors such as leaving trash. So by being sustainable on other planets, we would be protecting astrobiology. Also other fields, sciences such as geology or chemistry aren't protected by current planetary protection policies. So we would be allowing for scientists or for a larger group of scientists to continue to do good science by having sustainable exploration. The second reason is that we want to allow future generations to explore and gain from this exploration. And by exploring sustainability or by Exploring sustainably, we will allow for future generations to continue to explore for a long time. And the last, and this is a reason that we came up with through our discussions, is that sustainability on other planets would be aiding sustainability on Earth. And this is because we want to maintain a sustainable mindset wherever we go. People look up to space exploration as sort of the epitome of human technology and astronauts as sort of the best that humanity has to offer. And it wouldn't make sense to have the best of what we have to send to other planets. It wouldn't make sense to just have that be unsustainable if we want for us to have sustainability on Earth. We ultimately want to avoid creating the same problems on Mars that we have created on Earth. So it just wouldn't make sense to not explore sustainably. And the more concrete reason for how sustainable exploration would help Earth is through technology transfer, since space exploration technologies are ultimately used oftentimes on Earth. So by creating sustainable technologies for exploration, we would be able to use these sustainable technologies to solve our problems on Earth. Next, my partner will be talking about more of these sustainable technologies. Yes, so our next step was um, technological review. We have researched and analyzed the sustainable technology that currently exists or has been worked on so that we could consequently get an idea of what being sustainable on Mars would look like. The first thing that we noticed while studying sustainable systems was a new definition for sustainability, which in this case means being able to get higher quality results and products with um, fewer costs. We also noticed that the main requirements for sustainable systems that were mentioned more often were flexibility, adaptability, versatility, and survivability, which we gathered in the acronym FAVES to sum it all up. Next. As part of the technological review, we mentioned some experiments, studies, and tests that were conducted on board the International Space Station um, related to sustainability, going from Earth observation to algae to the extraction of carbon dioxide from exhaust gas streams. But what we really focused on was the ISS life support systems. So the oxygen generator, the carbon dioxide absorber, and the water recycler that we think will definitely be implemented in the future missions to Mars because it's basically an autonomous system uh, based on recycling. Next. We went over the sustainable technology that's currently being worked on. So um, electric propulsion and solar electric propulsion, then um, nuclear energy compared to solar and wind energy, and then also cyanobacteria, which turns out having many sustainable applications. Next. So we realized that being sustainable on Mars mainly means 
being as autonomous as possible and not depend on the supplies coming from Earth. So this means that future technologies should focus on um, taking advantage of the resources that can be found on the planet. So carbon dioxide, water, regulate sunlight and wind and implement sustainable systems so that, for example, if we take a quantity of water from the planet, we use it in a recycling systems and this way we don't have any wastes. Next slide. And next. Right. Um, so our future plan is to explore how um, sustainable Mars technology can be uh, applied to Earth and can be useful to Earth. And then based on that and based on our technological review, our goal, the goal of our paper is that of making policy recommendations for the sustainability of future missions to space and future missions to Mars, and therefore to expand planetary protection laws to include sustainability. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Paulina. Uh, that was great. Uh, so we are done with the Mars part of the presentation. We have a special bonus talk for you, which is uh, about setting up a microgravity uh, lab. And so for that, we have Brooke Shepard, who's recently moved to the Boston area. So Brooke, go ahead. Yeah, hi, Demetra. Thanks. Uh, give me just a, a second to share my screen here, and then we can go ahead and get started. Okay. Um, can you can you see my full slides? Yep. Okay, great. Okay, so as um, as Demetra said, my name is Brooke. Um, I did just move to the Boston area, um, so I'm from Oakland University, um, and right now I'm working at the um, Broad Institute um, of MIT and Harvard. But um, uh, today I'm going to talk about um, uh, basically a, uh, a simple way to, to be able to get more scientists, especially cell biologists, more involved in space biology research. Um, because I've, I found in, in my career that a lot of biologists, um, both students and PIs, um, can sometimes feel like space biology is just not in their field, it's not for them, um, and because they don't have a degree in it, uh, there's really nothing that they can add. And I, I'm sure that many people in this field have realized that um, there are a lot of experts in their fields that are not directly in space biology that have a lot to add. So it's really important to be able to try to include those PIs um, so that um, we can, you know, kind of continue to, um, to have that, um, the, the, those additions from, uh, from those experts in their field. So be before I go into actual methods, um, of our project that we worked on, I first kind of just wanted to, to frame this issue. So uh, this is a picture of my old research mentor, Luis, from Oakland University. Um, and Luis is an expert in stem cell biology. And so he was really interested in, in getting into space biology, um, mostly because his stem cells could have some really interesting applications in space. Um, so he had never done anything with space life sciences before. So obviously he couldn't send his samples into space, uh, but the next best thing was to be able to get a piece of technology that could simulate that space environment. So uh, we did some searching to try to figure out um, what would be the best way to be able to simulate that space environment. And we decided that using a clinostat would probably be the easiest way to do that. So a clinostat, if you don't know, is a machine that simulates the space environment, uh, the, the microgravity aspect of that space environment. And they basically rotate cells in a certain way so that the cells uh, think they're in zero gravity or microgravity when in reality they're here on Earth. So uh, in order for a machine to be a clinostat, it needs to do three things. Um, it needs to rotate the cells on the center of the axis of rotation so that instead of gravity just acting on the cells in one direction, uh, those cells are tumbling around and gravity is acting on all sides of the cell, almost like it's not acting on any of the sides. So that's kind of how it's going to simulate that microgravity environment. 
So it's going to rotate the cells on the center of the axis of rotation. It's going to reduce friction between the cell and the liquid that they're sitting in. And it's going to rotate at the optimal speed, which is usually between 60 and 80 RPM. So that's what a clinostat does. Um, and when we, um, you know, when, when we looked at Synthicon, which is a, a company that uh, makes bioreactors, um, we, we said, okay, this machine is really cool. Uh, how much does it cost? And they quoted us $5,000 USD. And unfortunately, that was just too much for our lab to be able to spend, uh, especially since that was a piece of technology that we didn't even know if we were going to use again. So um, this is the point where um, Luis and scientists like him are going to know to space biology because they can't send samples into space. They can't um, really use any clinostat that they can purchase. Uh, there aren't too many options for being able to simulate that space environment um, in the lab. So this is the point where uh, Dimitra and I talked and we decided uh, that I think we know a better way to do this. So instead of spending $5,000 on purchasing this clinostat, uh, we decided to 3D print our own. So our 3D printed design um, actually has more features than the model that I showed from Synthicon. Um, and it really is specifically designed to, to be able to, um, to, to be able to simulate that space environment. So some of the benefits of design that it rotates to two axis rotation instead of just one. Um, so that's going to more accurately represent that microgravity environment. It's also going to do the same thing as the other clinostat where it's going to reduce the friction, rotate at the optimal speed. Um, but another important piece is that it's compatible with radiation experiments. So the other Synthicon design uh, not available for exposing cells to radiation to be able to um, even more accurately simulate that space environment. So um, it's compatible with radiation experiments. And the biggest thing is that anybody can print it for just $100 or even less. So, um, you know, if you have that design and you have access to a 3D printer or a makerspace, um, then you can use this design and simulate microgravity. So that's a, um, a really exciting part of, of this design. So this is um, what, the, what the, the middle part of our design looks like that frame. So the samples will sit on the inside um, of that box on the inside and that box is going to rotate in one direction and then the uh, the frame outside of that box is going to rotate in a different direction um, to be able to rotate on those two axes of rotation. So um, those are the stages of design that we're at right now. And then once it's fully uh, 3D printed and, and the design is complete, we also need to make sure that we can prove that our clinostat does what all the other clinostats do. So to be able to do this, we wrote up to culture some E. coli in our clinostat to replicate all the current nations that we um, in other clinostats in space as well. And then after that, we're going to do the same thing, uh, but expose our samples to radiation as well to replicate those current observations that we see in all the other clinostats and in, in the space environment. So um, once this is the case, um, then anybody can use this design, anybody can print it, whether you're in California or New Zealand or UAE, you can collaborate with other labs um, at a, a really inexpensive price. Um, and scientists like Luis can actually contribute to space biology, that expertise um, that is definitely invaluable to, to being able to move this, um, this um, to, to move space biology forward. So um, with that, I just wanted to thank Demetra and the rest of the students who worked on this project, moving it from a design into something that really exists in real life. And if you want to use this technology when it's done, or if you have any advice for us, please reach out to me. Um, and we can um, elaborate. So thanks so much. I really appreciate it. All right. Thanks a lot, Brooke, and everybody else for uh, yeah, joining us today, for giving these talks. For some of you, uh, Caitlin in New Zealand, it's too late. Uh, for Paulina, it's uh, five o'clock in the morning for you. Yeah, so thanks for making it on such short notice. Uh, we have the Q&A feature. Uh, we had a few questions already answered. If you have any questions, please, the floor is open. Srini, do you have any questions or comments? Uh, it's very inspiring. 
very good that the students have been able to think through all these things. Thanks a lot for organizing this. Thanks. Or I have too many questions to ask. <laughs> yeah, we should probably have a separate meeting. Yeah, I think so, yeah. yeah. The question is the sustainability